So Free Press is a national, nonpartisan advocacy organization that is working to promote media and technology policy in the public interest. And it was started eight years ago, and it's actually kind of uh, bizarre if you think about it. Until we were started, there was no national organization of any real size that was actually advocating on behalf of the public interest on these issues. Which is pretty staggering when you consider that, uh, well, first of all, the gravity and implications of the internet that Tony alluded to, to the fact that uh, if you're a despot trying to take over a third world country, the first thing you do is take over the radio and television stations. It is the, the media is the fabric of society through which everyone learns about what's happening. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's absolutely central to this thing we call democracy. Not Conservative not by its nature, it's, it's industry. And they started PR shops and think tanks. They started hiring former government officials with really golden Rolodexes and unparalleled access. They started creating uh, this sort of labyrinth of supporting institutions that were helping to move and, and shape the news cycle and deter cr cranking out research, which is not always honest, but would support the goals and objectives of those companies. And this, this infrastructure, which I'm calling the elite corporate complex, built and got to a point where since then, in the 1970s, up until now, it is now completely omnipotent. And it cannot be stopped. Um, and we also have been very engaged in trying to stop the Comcast NBC deal. That infrastructure that I'm describing was able to, throughout the process, particularly around net neutrality, paint people like me and our organization in Washington as this sort of <clears throat> radical Marxist, socialist, sort of revolutionary, uh, bizarre offshoot that was really just, you know, completely off the reservation. And Glenn Beck would have these industry-funded uh, guests on his show and put a picture of me on his chalkboard. And there was, what was interesting about it was there was, no, there was no truth in anything that was being said. Like, truth was irrelevant. And that's why I believe very strongly, like Glenn Beck, for example, again, he's, he's called right wing, but not really. He's really more become sort of people like him because we're like this pawn of the industrial complex. And they called it a government takeover of the internet. They called it the fairness doctrine of the internet. All completely false. But a strong narrative that, 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 makes, that makes people in power nervous, made the Obama administration nervous. Um, and what we saw was um, an outcome which wasn't favorable. But before we get, let's say for a moment that we could solve this problem that I'm calling the, cor the elite corporate complex. Let's say that we could minimize their effect and influence in Washington and actually get the people at the front of the line again. The key question is, what does that matter if the American public are being propagandized, being fed sort of superficial soundbite crap on the media and, and are not aware of what's actually going on in the United States, local communities, and abroad? Well, there's a study by the Pew Center for People in the Press. There was one in 2000, there was another in 2009. And that study showed that in 2000, 74% of Americans cite television news as the number one source of news for their, for their, in their day. 74%. Nine years later in 2009, with the rise of the internet, if I were to tell you, and I'm going to, you'll be really surprised because most people think, oh, the internet really kind of replaced a huge chunk of that. That number only went from 74% to 69%. So in the same way that for probably people like Tony and I, it's surprising to hear, oh my gosh, you haven't heard of free press. I can't believe it. I've been in a bubble. We, in, uh, in the advocacy area, people who are in universities like you guys are, you're not aware that your media consumption habits are completely not in line with the rest of the country. Like that you are in a completely different zone. And the people who are across this country who are being sort of led by the nose to, you know, go protest town hall meetings that are designed to get more affordable health care to people, and they're getting angry, they're getting ginned up, they're watching TV. 
and they're listening to commercial radio. And so the fundamental question we have to ask is, if, if that's what's happening, if, if, if as Thomas Frank, the author, says, uh, people are being compelled and manipulated into rising up and advocating against their very own interests, which is a serious problem, and we're seeing it over and over and over again. Um, then the question is, why is that happening and how do we fix it? And then, again, all you have to do is turn on commercial television or commercial radio, and the answer is very clear. There is no real, other than maybe 60 minutes, honestly, I mean, other than like maybe three programs, there is no substantive, thoughtful, critical <laughs> journalism on commercial television and radio. That's not hyperbole, it's, it's, a, it's a fact. We are seeing as a well-documented freefall in journalism jobs as Classified ads go to Craigslist, revenue goes down in newspapers, <clears throat> newspapers get smaller and smaller, and there's less and less reporting. Why does that matter? Newspapers constitute the vast majority of actual original reporting in communities across the country. There's a very real possibility that in a few years, we really will have an even, a, 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 a we're getting close to it, but a, a real crisis in journalism. Like, Many communities where there's no, literally no eyes and ears for the America, for the public. On Citizens United happened uh, about a year ago, a little, just a few days more than a year ago, and it was a ruling by the Supreme Court that said that the government uh, cannot limit anyone's right to corporations, mainly corporations' right to uh, spend money on political ads explicitly calling for the election or defeat of candidates. So what we're starting to see right now, and, and I've kind of put this out of order, so forgive me, but what we're starting to see is that undergirds this omnipotent power by the, the bells and the, and the cable companies. These guys, lobbyists, are basically doing what was reserved for like mafia thugs, and now they're doing it and it's legal. So they go into congressional members' offices in Washington, and they basically say, legally, you either vote with us on net neutrality or sign this letter or whatever, or we're going to spend tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to, on your opponent, to support your opponent and get you out of office. This is a, this is a, a mind-boggling concept when you consider that the dollars that these companies have are so massive. These companies that make uh, billions, with a B, in profits every year, how much expense is it really for them to spend 30, 40 million dollars a year? It's why the phone and cable companies, the telecommunications industry, is second only to the pharmaceutical industry in Washington lobbying. Most people don't realize that. We're up against the second largest lobby in Washington. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. And then, but the third thing is, I think, is, is unringable, which is, um, I think because of the failure of public education, the the, the poor funding and the, and the slow demise of public education, people, Americans are decreasingly, in my view, able to engage in basic critical thinking. And in fact, they don't even have ba a basic sense of civics, sort of a, base, a basic framework of the history of our country, for example. And that's another challenge, which could be remedied with, with progressive policy, but that's a long haul fix. Um, but I would submit to you that if we had commercial television, I shouldn't, I'm sorry, not commercial, television of any sort that was more, where you found it more ubiquitous to come across thoughtful, intelligent reporting, um, likewise on radio, that you would have the, the increase of a more informed, more enlightened electorate. I mean, where, do you think anybody could have found in the past year a thoughtful story on commercial television or radio about Egypt before the, the protests erupt, erupted. I would hazard a guess, we know that the Cairo bureaus for the networks were closed long ago, that there was not a single substantive story about the politics or history or state of Egypt on any commercial television or radio in this country for the past year at least. That's a problem. If you go and public television can't afford to do it, so they don't. If you go to England and you turn on the BBC, you can be sure they've reported on Egypt many times over the past year. And people see that. That's the number one source of news in that country. They learn. They're more engaged. We have 
stupid shouting heads, like, you know, as these companies go to cut costs, they don't do reporting, that's too expensive. They just put people with opinions on blathering about American politics.